think Jim reported the gun earlier. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, let's start. Uh, thanks for coming uh, this evening uh, for a special seminar. Uh, Christos Koidas, uh, most of you, you know him, he's been involved with SDN since the very beginning. He's a, a, a senior research scientist at Orans, and today he's going to be talking about NFV, how to bundle NFV with SDN, and uh, an open call for researchers to, to work on this stuff. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Yanni, and I'd like to thank uh, Nick and his group also for supporting this. Um, thanks for all of your <coughs> Uh, today at such a late uh, uh, time in the day. So um, I'll be talking about uh, modeling NFT and STN, uh, so like in, in the open networking framework, as you can see, I, I used all, all, all the different passwords that I used today. <laughs> I can do that, uh, worse than that. But hopefully we'll you know, reach a, a point where it you know, makes it interesting. And so this is like work in progress, meaning that you know, uh, this is like some like thoughts that I have and also the, the group behind uh, NFV uh, also has. And also, uh, and if you you know if you don't agree with something, you know feel free to uh, speak up. And if you need to ask a question or something that it's not really clear, you can stop me. Otherwise, defer questions to the very uh, to the very end. So that's in terms of uh, context. Uh, NFV is about the abstraction of uh, network functions from dedicated hardware, and I'll get to that uh, later on. And the, uh, the, the 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 kind of definition that most of us at least agrees the uh, SDN is the abstraction of the control plane from the uh, data plane. So the, uh, the, the concept behind NFV is that if you look on the thing on your uh, uh, left, you see the, the legacy uh, network uh, deployment that we have today in our networks, uh, whether it's a data, data center network or it's a telco network or a network network. We have all these different hardware that is uh, dedicated to a specific network function. We have uh, load balances, you know, firewalls, and deep packet inspection uh, um, devices and so forth. And, and, and you have one physical node per, per row. Right? So we have one particular box that does one something specific. And also it requires physical installing. So you have to send someone out in the, in the, uh, uh, in the field to install that. It's very static, so which means it's very hard to you know, move. Uh, it also makes it very inefficient in terms of uh, if you need to um, uh, um, handle uh, spikes in the traffic. And also uh, it's inefficient because most of them actually are sized for peaks, right? Um, and if you only it's like 10% utilized, obviously that uh, device is underutilized. So as a result, this is very hard to scale up and, and out. So the, uh, the uh, vision behind NFV is that we should try to move everything into software. Okay? Anything that exists today in, in, in terms of network elements it, uh, and it runs on hardware, we should move that into software running on commoditized uh, um, servers, essentially. And, uh, uh, and that gives rise to uh, the virtual network appliance. So um, now in order to achieve the same performance, obviously you have to use a high volume number of servers, right? Because it's not like one, one, uh, only one server was going to match the performance of one particular, particular box. Uh, and I would say here standardized servers doesn't necessarily mean, and I want to clear that because it's misconception out there that we're talking about x86 type of architectures. That's not true. It can, it can be any architecture, right? Uh, some people obviously, you know, they, they, they're using X86 platforms, and obviously that's what they advertise. But if you look at the white paper that we did in October 2012, we never said that it has to run on X86. Actually, as far as I'm concerned, it can run these functions on bare metal servers. They don't even have to uh, uh, use virtualization, right? But we think that we, in order to reach the uh, economies of scale, that they have to run on, on uh, VMs. So that's the, that's the, uh, the, the vision of the behind NFV. And everything that you see here, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, you get the contrast, the exact uh, mirror uh, description of, uh, uh, of the appliances. Uh, now that software base, you can have multiple roles for uh, on, on running on the same hardware because the hardware not right now is your, your server. It can be remotely operated, and that's a big uh, 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 plus for us as an operator. If we want to uh, dispatch someone out in the field, we can run things uh, remotely. Uh, you know, it's the scale and so forth. Okay, so um, so like a, this is like summarize of the different uh, types of applications that we see in a V fitting. Essentially, anything that runs again today uh, in the uh, network uh, operators environment can be moved into uh, into uh, uh, v into software running on uh, on servers from you know, mobile networks to um, you know home environment, including your home router, hopefully um, any uh, CDN security is very very big. 
and uh, traffic monitoring and so forth. So anything, again, that runs on dedicated hardware today, the vision behind it, and it begins to move into, uh, into software. Um, this is uh, one slide, because, uh, and thanks, Yanni, for uh, asking this question. So just to give you uh, the, the, uh, the framework, we operate under ETSI. ETSI is the European uh, Telecommunication Standards Institute. It's based in Europe, but this is a global effort. We have 28-plus uh, uh, carriers. On, uh, signed on this uh, on this effort, um, and we have more than 200 members. I, I've been lucky enough actually to uh, um, be involved, for, you know, in this group from the uh, you know from the get go essentially. So it is a, it, it, we operate as a standards uh, body. The only thing is that we don't produce standards. So the, the goal here, the objective here for the ETSI NRV is to produce the specifications. We have a lifespan of two years, and actually we're going to expire net now January of 2015. So we have uh, four working groups that try to you know, cover most of the uh, areas that we think are, are uh, of uh, interest, you know, from the infrastructure to the uh, software architecture to the management orchestration, which is a very important area, as, as we'll talk later on. We have also uh, reliability and availability, and also have a couple of uh, sec uh, expert groups on security and uh, performance and portability. So, uh, so the main output is just like guidelines? Yes, so the, the main output, right. right, the main output actually is guidelines and in fact we published the first set of documents uh, uh, November, October uh, last year that covers the use cases, the, architect the architectural uh, reference framework, terminology uh, and also uh, an important aspect of it are the proof of concepts. So essentially, you, know, still, well, now you can see how this can happen in absence of standards, you know, well, I mean, it's sort of like a, you know, an effort at this point, right, to see what it leads us. The idea is that once this uh, group expires next year, maybe we'll see whether it's going to uh, transform itself into a, a standards body or, you know, uh, or maybe kind of split uh, all the different pieces and then, you know, different organizations actually can, can pick up the piece and, and, and move on. Uh, so again, you know, we don't produce, yes. Uh, can you describe the scope of proof concepts? Like, are they in the lab setting? Are they pseudocode, or are they actually yeah, so, working in the field? Right. So they have to be. Uh, well, it, 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 it varies. So we've seen proof of concept like in a lab environment, uh, essentially, uh, or it could be some pilot project out in the field. Uh, the the um, the ob objective of that is, is to sort of like you know showcase you know what you can do with NFP and also to uh, you know expose any issues. Uh, so you can feed that back into the working groups. Um, the way that box are structured is that you have to have one operator uh, plus two vendors minimum, right? So because obviously, you know, this is to showcase how the uh, operators can use NRV uh, to, um, you know, uh, um, essentially uh, implement these in, in, their, in their networks. So is there someone who says that, okay, this proof of concept yeah. meets the guidelines? Or, right. Or so it, it, the, the process actually is quite loose at this point. So it's not like there's a formal body that says, you know, uh, it, it yes or no. So essentially, it, Etsy and um, I think that the, the chair of the reliability group essentially said if it conforms to the guidelines that we have published, you know, it, it's, a, you know, it's a go ahead. So we have so far, I think we leave 14 or 15 box some of them, you know, are really important. Other ones, you know, are marginal. But yeah, there's not like any stringent process that says, you know, you can be part of it or not. And that's what you're asking. So it's pretty loose at this point. Um, okay. So I, I, I would be happy to ask more of these questions. I didn't. I don't have much stuff, you know, on the box and, and the Etsy structure because this stuff is about STM and NRV uh, in the um, open networking environment. But I'll be happy to, uh, you know, share. Uh, slides later on if, if you have questions. Okay, so um, so why NRV? So we think that NRV you know, presents a number of uh, benefits. Uh, so I sort of like summarize this in what they call the uh, EVA principle, elasticity, velocity, and agility. That's flexibility to you know, rapidly, dynamically, uh, essentially um, provide and instantiate uh, those functions because now these are running on VMs, so you can launch them, at, you know, whenever you think that there's a need uh, for that. It's an increased uh, speed time to market. This is very important for us as network operators if we want to uh, launch a new service. Um, in the past, or actually currently, it takes too long because we know we have to work with the hardware vendors. We think that once you move things into software, you know, it, it gives you more uh, uh, flexibility and speed. 
and it's also pressing uh, efficiency because now you know if everything is running on, on VMs that presents a more homogeneous type of environment versus uh, in an environment we have to deal with uh, uh, you know many many uh, vendors at the same time. Um, we think that this is going to lead also to reduced equipment costs, but you have to keep in mind here that uh, instead of like buying a hardware, dedicated hardware, I have to buy those servers, right? So we need to sort of like do the, the, uh, the analysis here. We need to do this kind of exercise, the, uh, trying to you know, find the, the right business case and say, you know, if I have one box here, it maps to that many VMs and actually do the actual cost, you know, how much this is going to cost. So no one's done that yet. So no one has done that yet. I mean, as far as I haven't seen it, and it's not really a mandate. So we're not really. So that's why I focus less on the um, capex and opex benefits, and people will say, oh yeah, we think that's going to lead to that at some point. But I cannot tell you whether it's going to be 30 percent. It's going to be a, a mere 10 percent today. So, uh, uh, so, but we're hoping that people, you know, will work on that, and maybe vendors can come and say, come up and say, you know, this is what you guys are saving, and, and so forth. That's going to be very case dependent, I think, in my mind. But it's a very important exercise to do, right? Because that's that's the that's where the success of this thing is um, uh, lies. Um, and um, but we think that that you know, in terms of uh, certain opex, uh, we're going to see some savings. Whether it's the energy, you know, how much electricity you have to pay for that, uh, and, and especially in, in terms of skill set, because now when you start moving things into VMs, we think that the required skill set in terms of personnel is only going to be as demanding as today with the uh, dedicated uh, hardware. But again, this is something that remains to be seen. So in your experience, do carriers have these kind of people that work with software, work with VMs, and less with hardware? And yeah, so what, what we will see happening, uh, so, this is, uh, so today things are run mostly by the network, uh, by the, uh, by the Nopwitz Network Operator uh, Center. Uh, and uh, so when you move to this, uh, this environment where you have things running on, on, on servers, that's an IT department, that's right? right. So, so the answer to your question is yes, major uh, vendors, major, I'm sorry, major operators do have the, the, uh, the, uh, the resource to do that, but what we see actually is the convergence between the network infrastructure uh, people and also the uh, IT people. Um, but again, I don't emphasize this right now because, again, this remains to be seen. I want to emphasize on the fact that since now we're moving things to the software, that opens up a number of opportunities for us. And plus, we know we try to you know, avoid and stay away from that vendor uh, lock-in that we have today when it comes to dedicated uh, hardware. Okay, so we have, uh, as part of, the, um, of these specifications that we're producing, we have a, a document on use cases. And uh, I think there are like a number of use cases there, I think uh, seven or eight or, or ten, I can't remember the exact number. But we have split up the use cases into uh, architectural use cases. And uh, uh, so here I mentioned a few of interest. One is the web performance visualization infrastructure as a service, which is uh, essentially uh, this diagram here. It's not, uh, uh, and I'll come back to that later on to explain that. The virtual network function as a service. So where you actually can deploy a VNF, a VNF is a virtual, uh, virtualized network function. So if you want to run a firewall, for instance, you know you can go to uh, a provider uh, that provides that as a service and uh, you know get that uh, from them. Or it can be uh, you know the virtualized CP, uh, something that you can also run uh, remotely as a service. Then there's also the virtual network platform as a service. That's another use case, essentially. Uh, in terms of scope, the VNPIS is, is larger than, than this one. It allows also for multi-tenancy at the VNF level. And uh, the, the, uh, one of the, the last use cases presented here is the VNF forwarding graph. Now, this is the same as the service chaining, in case you've heard that term before. Now, I'm assuming that most of you have heard that uh, before. Okay, so I'll come back to this example later on. I have a few slides to uh, that describe that. As, uh, Okay, uh, so the other set of use cases that that document includes are, are, are service-oriented use cases. So uh, these are like more, uh, uh, they're like bigger in terms of scope. Here you can see different, essentially entire architectures presented as, as, uh, as use cases. As you see the mobile uh, uh, core network, for instance, the base station, the CRAM, uh, the home environment as, as you know, uh, in its totality. 
Uh, CDMs, you know, it's another uh, important use case for us, especially for us as, as ORMs. We are you know, uh, submitting a talk on uh, on uh, CDM. Uh, so the, the interesting thing that, and I'll come back to the issue of a uh, 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 whole packet called the whole VPC, is that only you can uh, uh, essentially transform dedicated hardware in, into uh, you know the, those single boxes, but you can take entire architectures and move these into uh, into software. And uh, I'll, I'll talk at the end uh, uh, about the uh, APC uh, test that we're building, uh, building in our lab in, uh, in San Francisco. So you see, and, and then I'll also uh, showcase you know, how STN also fits into that. Okay, so this is the reference architecture model that we came up. Uh, again, this is work that was done last year, so you see a number of pieces here. The important thing to remember is that this is the, uh, the infrastructure that it's uh, the, v, uh, v, uh, the VNFs will be running on. So you see the virtual computing storage and, and, and network. Um, and this is the actual hardware resources. That's, that's the uh, infrastructure, the network function visualized uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, on top of that, you have the VNFs uh, running. And uh, you see the OSS, the VSS system. That, that's very uh, integral part of our um, open operators uh, uh, network. And uh, on the side here, you see the management orchestration. So the management orchestration is responsible for the lifetime management of those, uh, of those VNFs. Now, those VNFs, again, run on VM instances, right? So someone has to launch those VMs. If you need to move a VM, you know, somebody has to take care of that. Uh, if you need to tear down, you know, bring down a VM, uh, uh, someone has to do that. So that's part of the... Uh, of the management orchestration, that's, and that's a, a, you know the most critical part in uh, NFP. So you have the visualized infrastructure manager here that manages the infrastructure. You have the managers here that manage the uh, VNFs, and also this is the orchestrator. So this again is a very very key component in uh, in NFP. Um, so uh, in, in terms of uh, examples here, I'm and I'm going to be focusing most of my talk today is going to be focusing on the service chaining, which I think presents most of the interest when it comes to NLE and SDN. So it gives an example of, uh, of a service chain where everything is virtualized, so you don't have any physical boxes in your infrastructure. So it shows you know, have all these different uh, VNFs running, and the different uh, lines here represent the, uh, uh, flow, uh, the traffic flow. You know, the packets coming into the system, you have to somehow dispatch and say, okay, this packet has to go to the load balancer, and from the load balancer it has to go to the firewall. Uh, and from the firewall, you know, to some other VNF, right? That constitutes the, the composition or chain of uh, VNFs, of the virtualized, virtualized uh, network functions. So different colors here represent different essentially service chains, if you like. And again, this is totally a uh, virtualized uh, uh, environment. Now, VNFs, they have a metadata associated with them because you may want to identify VNF, right? So that's, that's a, uh, an open research problem. Actually, um, and uh, the second example is when you go to an environment, which is most likely that's where you know we'll start with, where you have a hybrid infrastructure. You have physical boxes that exist today in the network, and then also you have the virtualized uh, part of it that it's going to uh, augment or enhance the uh, physical infrastructure. Now. Having said that, because the question of migration will come up, right? How do we migrate? That's not going to be uh, that hard um, uh, yeah. because uh, you can run these things in parallel. So you can have your physical infrastructure that runs as, as it as does today, and also you can start building your virtualized infrastructure at the same time, right? So that's going to be an issue. You know, we can do that in parallel. The only issue here is that when it comes to traffic, someone has to decide, okay, this packet needs to go to the you know, physical infrastructure, and this packet needs to go to the visualized infrastructure. So I think that's, that's going to be one of the uh, uh, components when it comes to uh, hybrid infrastructures. And uh, so essentially, you know, it's this picture here, right? I apologize that these are not that visible, at least I cannot see them myself. Uh, so, but you have you know, those physical boxes, and also you have those VNS running. Uh, and uh, the, uh, another example here, which I think is of interest, which is kind of like new when you start thinking about the, the VNFs, is we can have nested uh, VNFs. You can have a, a VNF within another uh, VNF. Um, uh, so that opens up uh, you know, new uh, think areas of, uh, of research uh, as, as well. 
Okay. Um, so, so here I have like a, a couple of slides on, on these are like my personal thoughts. So when we you know move to this new paradigm of, of where everything is, is virtualized, uh, I, I like to you know sort of like pose and ask a few questions. So question number one is whether we need to build a data plane which is NFB aware, or if we need to make our you know our data plane NFB aware. Right? So with the physical hardware, again, connection between the boxes are static, so nothing moves, right? Uh, that's pretty much it. When you go to uh, this uh, uh, NFB environment, everything is dynamic, and you can have VMs moving around, you know, going to you know other other um, other racks, other data centers across your infrastructure. So it's totally different uh, dynamic environment. So uh, and, and keeping that in mind, then the forwarding plane needs to handle you know, that flow uh, forwarding and, and, and switching. And you need to somehow keep track of how the flows in the network you know, tra traverse across the different uh, uh, servers. And also, when it comes to bandwidth requirements, you know, things are changing. Because again, in the, in, in the current paradigm, you have static connections, right? So the bandwidth on, on, a, on a specific connection is given, and it cannot be changed. But when you move things around, Again, everything becomes more dynamic. So how do I make sure that I allocate the right capacity, for instance, to a service chain that, that needs a particular, uh, has a particular uh, uh, specific bandwidth uh, requirements? And, and, uh, and this has to be done not just at the single uh, node level, but I think most like uh, at the network uh, uh, level uh, as well. Uh, and also we think that multi-tenancy will have to pay, play a big role when it comes to uh, So the next question, obviously, is okay. Do we need an NFPA work control plane, right? Uh, having said that about the data, the data plane, so when, when it comes to the control plane, uh, now servers can host multiple uh, uh, VNFs, right? Uh, they don't have one, so not only one uh, visualizing, visualizing a function. The, uh, we have the uh, network service composition. This is the service chain I talked about. You know, you have a number of uh, firewalls, load balancers, you know, interconnected. Like, do I need a control plane essentially to again keep track of these type of connections of the, of the, of the, of the uh, you know, creating those service chains? And uh, so uh, also the control plane needs to maintain some traffic steering. Uh, what about quality of service and other policy rules that you may have? And also, uh, as I said before, we're going to see, uh, at least for some time, a, a mixed environment where you have virtualized and non-virtualized uh, elements in your network. And the question I also ask you at the end is that, do we actually need a controller for NMB? And as perhaps as you have guessed, the, the third uh, pillar here is whether uh, we should make our applications NMB aware. And what does it mean, right? So first of all, we have to see what is the impact. It's going to be the impact of current applications that are running today on a network, and uh, adapt these existing applications to this uh, new environment, or perhaps design new applications that take into account the the um, uh, the NLB, uh, um, environment. Um, also, the, this application, at least in my mind, has to be uh, very optimized oriented because now you uh, the kind of we have. You have pooled resources, which is kind of different from what you have in the past. In the past, you have dedicated resources to all these uh, different functions, but uh, um, now you have pooled uh, resources, so you have to make sure that you know you use those resources uh, uh, effectively and uh, and efficiently. And uh, and, and the, the other uh, thing I have here is that whether you know whether that's what's the role of the non-bound interface between the VNFs and the uh, application. So today, you don't have applications uh, that, uh, at least, you know, maybe you have a few applications, we look at CDN, but most applications don't directly interact with the physical boxes today, right? They run on top of, 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 um, of your system. Uh, but as we open up those VNS, maybe you can have applications that directly communicate <coughs> or interface, if you like, with the, um, with the virtualized network. Uh, we also think that you know once you're going into this uh, and this uh, thing that that opens up some monetization opportunities for us, uh, particularly for service providers. Again, these are questions I'm just throwing out uh, to see what people think and, and whether you know this, it doesn't mean that Etsy actually were doing that today. This is my only uh, thoughts. Okay, so when we published the uh, the white paper back in October of 2012. 
were actually uh, quite visionary to uh, include this uh, Venn diagram from, you know, from, very, from the very beginning. So we had the open innovation as, as one circuit here. We have SDN, because SDN we think is an integral part of, of, uh, of this effort. Uh, and also this, this, the, 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 the third cycle here was the NFP. As you see, this, all these the cycles are intersect. Okay, they don't overlap exactly. 100%, but they intersect. So obviously, we like to operate uh, uh, right there. But for now, you know, we think that there is uh, definitions between STN and NFP. These are independent technologies, they're independent uh, 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 architectures, if you like. Uh, they don't depend on each other, but they can benefit uh, if, if they work together. That's, that's, it's my also personal conviction, and actually that's what people think also within the, uh, the group. So that's the uh, intersect there. And again, keep in mind that the common denominator here is software. So you, when you look at SDN, you have software, and, and, and everything in NFP is actually software. So that simplifies things a lot when it comes to uh, essentially uh, leveraging SDN in, uh, in NFP. So, so uh, let's see what kind of role uh, SDN then can play uh, in NFP. So, uh, in, in my mind, I think it can play a big role in the orchestration of the infrastructure, whether it's uh, physical or, or, or virtual, when it comes to the provisioning of configuring those VNFs. Again, someone has to do that, right? It's not like I'm, I don't plug a box into the network, and even if I do, you know, that you have configuration running on that one, but here it's, it's more like an ad hoc type of uh, environment. Um, allocate and manage resources, for instance, bandwidth, uh, you have to, again, maybe have to move uh, VMs uh, across servers or even across uh, uh, data centers. Uh, automation programmability, security and policy control, very, very important when it comes to uh, NLD. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, STN can provide that unified, unified sorry, control and management uh, plane. Uh, another area that I think that it's, it's, uh, uh, STN can play a key role is the service chain, which is exactly the uh, forwarding graph that I talked about before. Again, you need someone to essentially direct those flows to VNFs. And uh, though most of you are familiar, obviously, uh, work with OpenFlow. Uh, if you look at the OpenFlow switches, you know, then you know, OpenFlow can be uh, one tool essentially to uh, do this type of uh, traffic thing across the NLP uh, network. Um, the other important thing is, is being able to characterize uh, traffic flows. So if I know that a flow has been originated from a mobile user, that might be important in terms of uh, handling that flow into the network. Um, I think that would be key for us. Uh, and, and when you look at the end-to-end -end type of uh, scenarios. Um, so NFV, again, again, has this dynamic uh, environment uh, with, uh, you know, you know provides that uh, nice logical map of, of the network, so I think that that, that can become uh, handy. Um, you will need to set up virtual networks eventually in an NLV network. Uh, so we think again STN can play a role here, um, and this can be ad hoc uh, uh, and on demand essentially virtual networks. Um, we may have to extend the management orchestration to include network management. Again, you know, there's a question mark here. Um, and uh, now, when it comes to actually you know battling those you know STN and NAV together, uh, I don't think it's going to be you know, that that easy essentially, because you have to deal with, you know, uh, environments which is like visualized and non-visualized, right? And so if, it, if it's a visualized environment, it's easier to integrate SDN, but if it's something which is not visualized and have legacy equipment, you know, that's going to be a, a bit of a challenge to when it comes to at least uh, uh, SDN. Um, and, um, and also, what happens if you have to run NFP across SDN boundaries? Right? You have an SDN domain, another SDN domain, but you essentially want to run NFV across these. That might be another area of uh, resource. So, but uh, in essence, we think that SDN still can enable uh, and uh, simplify and automate uh, uh, implementations of uh, OPMFs. So, um, and apologies if you guys don't agree with me on this thing here, but that's like simplified version of uh, SDN. You have your uh, uh, resource, hardware resource here at the bottom. 
that uh, interfacing protocols are running between the, uh, the SDN uh, layer, and on top you have application services, functions, utilities, and things that runs essentially on top of your SDN control uh, the plane. And you have the different APIs, this is very, very important, obviously, to uh, uh, provide the glue between the different layers. Uh, NFV is the, uh, um, the uh, reference model I presented before. So if you look at an SDN-based NFV, maybe you have something like that, which is uh, much, much different than the NFV picture. The only thing here is that it have the SDN controller perhaps part of the management space. So we think that, uh, at least in my view, uh, something like that can be integrated uh, here. And you still need those APIs and interfaces uh, to run um, in, in, uh, in your in, uh, infrastructure. Okay. Again, we can discuss that, but that I, I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I think this is something that we have uh, essentially uh, adopted in uh, NFV, but we, have, we don't have yet the, the details of how this is going to be implemented. Uh, open networking and NFV, uh, as we're looking at uh, different things, uh, and, uh, with different open efforts, as you know, open is, is being used and abused today in many uh, contexts. So. When we talk about open networking, okay, we need to answer, you know, what should be open? So, should be just open source, which is a software? Uh, what about the design, the hardware? As you know, there are like uh, um, efforts going on within the OCP uh, uh, project, the Open Compute project, open standard. That sounds like an oxymoron because the standard, you know, um, is a standard, right? There's no open and closed standards. But what I mean here is uh, maybe something can start as an open uh, effort in terms of standardizing and then it can lead to a standard that can be adopted by one of these standardization bodies. Um, uh, open interface, uh, APIs, uh, open SDKs. So, um, so in my mind, if, if you ask me, okay, what should be open, how would you define an open uh, networking system? I would probably say that it has to include at least two of these. Two of these, you know, should make an open, uh, open. you can say only one should make it open, but if, if we want to be a little bit, you know, Stringent about it, or a little bit more fair about it. I would probably say at least we need at least two to, for some to qualify as an open uh, networking system. Uh, it is important to have an open uh, ecosystem behind it that, that, that people can call us and say, you know, um, uh, contribute into this. Uh, it's very important that anything which is open is not controlled by a single vendor. So that's what that, that's very very important. Um, the coupling of software and hardware, essentially that's what an open networking system is. The benefits, and this is stuff that I guess you guys know about. The, the important thing here is the modularization, because now I can choose those different pieces. Once you segregate the hardware from the software, I can you know, uh, customize my, my, my system, and I can get the best footprint for different components, whether it's software or whether it's hardware. Uh, you know, you have different things going on today. You have you know, the bare metal switches are being offered in the market, then you have big switch networks providing the software, you have Cumulus uh, providing the software, and so forth. So we see this kind of movement happening today uh, in uh, networking, and you know, I think this is, this is good. But let's see what that's gonna be. Um, reduced cost, obviously, because now you can customize things, that, that's, uh, that's uh, not rare. And the other <coughs> thing for us is it's, it's the, the uh, flexibility to, to be able to uh, uh, upgrade when we need because things are running in software, right? So if I don't like something or something happens to that company, you know, I can. It's not going to be as seamless as it sounds, but you know, if I want to, you know, uh, uh, go to another vendor, you know, it gives me more flexibility. Uh, issues again: is how do you integrate all these different pieces, and who's going to do this integration? And back to your question, uh, it's not going to be us as operators. So I don't have the skill set to take, you know, the, uh, you know. Uh, and bare metal suites and, and the software and say, oh, I'm going to put those two things together and, and run these. We have perhaps have to rely on, on third parties to do this, uh, make sure to this uh, integration. Uh, there are also other issues involved when it comes to at least the car environment, whether it's the uh, high availability and uh, SLAs and all of that nice stuff that comes when you're uh, with a carrier, uh, including regulation, security, and so forth. I'm not going to go through the list uh, here. Uh, the, the one thing I'd like to point out here when I was like working on these slides, it just occurred to me that the virtual switches actually will have to play a big role when it comes to, um, uh, to this type of environment. 
Um, and the reason I mention that is because when I talk about service chaining, and I think we have only about 10 minutes left, about uh, you, you'll see why I think that that's going to be very, very important. Okay. Um, so this is the same architecture again. You can see how the different open uh, efforts map into uh, this picture here. You can see the uh, you know uh, uh, the honor system, uh, uh, the DVDK from Intel, the OCP down here, and OpenStack. I think OpenStack still can play a big role uh, in this uh, in this picture. And I think OpenStack is the next slide. Uh, and I've been thinking about OpenStack for a long time now. And uh, so from a previous picture, OpenStack fits into uh, two areas. One is the area where it actually uh, is used for uh, uh, managing the virtualized infrastructure, which is exactly what happens today. But I think also there's a huge potential for OpenStack to play a role in uh, managing and orchestrating the VNFs themselves, the virtual network functions themselves. Uh, and actually, uh, there was a, 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 a summit uh, last week in Atlanta, and uh, they, they started talking about kind of the with the context of uh, uh, OpenStack. Uh, again, it, it can be you know, extremely important in setting up those multi-tenant networks for NLV, resource management and scheduler. That, I think that, that's important. And the, the one bullet here that you know, I throw here is that maybe OpenStack can become the open solution for that service chain. Because the risk here is that once you, you know, you're going into this service chain, we see different efforts from vendors today. Right, so uh, let's you know, company A says, "Oh, here's my service chaining uh, uh, solution," but it works only with company B, C, and D, right? But if you have a VNF from company E, how do you make sure that these can, you know, uh, be plugged into your, you know, that service chain? So I think, in my mind at least, like open efforts can, can provide the solution here, right? And obviously, these uh, obviously some vendors won't like what I'm saying, but. Yes. Why is it like that? I mean, if technically, if you put the, a, a network function into a, into a VM, right, it doesn't matter what the VM is, right? So, why is company A's service chaining solution not working with any VM, just B, C, D's VMs? Well, ideally, that should be the case, right? But I'm, yeah, I, I can I'm, guarantee for sure that this is going to happen, right? So let me talk about service chaining, and we can discuss that because I have a few slides of service chaining. So, uh, so we can we can. So I, I mean, ideally that would be the case, right? But you have to have the right interfaces for that. But l let me talk about service chaining, and I'll come back to that. So the, the other thing that really comes up a, a lot is the network as a service. So once you move everything into software, and you can think that this can run on VMs somewhere, what people call cloud today. Uh, that opens up opportunities for, for service providers to uh, offer things uh, as, as a service. So that's the uh, national network as a service comes back. Uh, we, can have, we can offer slices from the network to uh, third, uh, third parties. Um, and the other thing about uh, OpenStack, I think it has the resistance of APIs, and I think that's what really makes the appealing to uh, to it. OK, I think I'm going to skip this slide because we're running out of time. Uh, let me talk a little bit about, about the research and then the last topic I have is the service chain. So, because I, one of the reasons I want to talk to you today also is that we're coming up with a number of research topics and uh, these being Stanford, we hope that some of them might be of interest to you. Um, so we have a, a list of uh, research topics that we announced and, and uh, on our website and that includes that, you know, everything of, of course of, you know, that, that uh, uh, is a potential area of research, uh, measure service chaining, the orchestration, uh, uh, algorithms, uh, and then controllers, STM controllers for NFP, uh, traffic steering and dispatching. Uh, you have to look whether it's a pure virtualized environment or a hybrid environment. Performance studies, and that goes back to the issue that I talked about in the very beginning. I'd like to see you know, where you can compare apples to apples, right? Uh, and. Uh, and what are the research requirements when you move things into VM? We have no time like that. Uh, any latency uh, measurements, optimization techniques, system bottlenecks that uh, people might uh, uh, discover. So going back to the question why we haven't done that. So what has happened today is that some of projects have independently done performance studies before starting actually NLV. And they, have, they were able to see themselves. I haven't done these studies ourselves within Orange. They were able to uh, uh, see the benefits of moving this into uh, into virtualized environment. 
but have not seen a concrete thing yet, whether it's under Etsy or by a vendor that says, this is the, uh, the, the hardware uh, uh, solution here, the box, and we can move things into VMs. You need that many VMs, and these are the requirements, and this is how much it's gonna cost you to deploy this solution. Um, so when I work, used to work for a small company right here, one of the things I used to do back then was a use cases. So when we need to you know, move to, uh, to uh, business use, uh, use case, when I have to you know, move to a, uh, when trying to deploy new technology, we have to work the uh, the numbers. Okay, does it make sense to you know move into this technology? And, and usually, also there's you know some sort of things involved in terms of uh, return to investment. Yes. Why don't the people who do the 14, 15 POCs? Why don't they do that? I mean, because wouldn't that be yes. like the very first? Right. So no, because first you have to prove that something works, and once you prove something works, then it's okay if it works. Okay, does it now make sense to do it? Could be the other uh, way around. <laughs> it could be the other way around. I mean, the part of no, but, does it work? Right. But how, how do you know that? Right performance, right? Yeah, but the first one, I have to make sure that something works. Right? When something works, it's okay, now I can move things into VMs. The question that comes up, okay, how many VMs do I need for that? Right. So, but I mean, it can be the chicken and the egg. You could have started, you know, saying that, okay, let's do the economics. So, as I said, one operator, and I think it's public, which is telecom, they've done performance studies prior to, you know, uh, to embarking on, on a really, and they show that there are, you know, some benefits. But for me to be convinced and say, you know, the, the question is, is not whether we're going to be saving anything. The question is how much we're going to be saving. Right? It's going to be 30% savings. It's going to be 10, only 10% savings, or it's going to be a dramatic as 80%. So that's, and again, it's going to be very, very case, case specific. When you look at these different use cases, you know, the CDN will have different savings from, from you know, from, from, um, from the, uh, the EPC or, or something else. So, but, and then you have to think that these are things that we're still evolving, right? Uh, we have vendors coming up with our software solutions, so we try to plug this in and, and see where it leads us. Okay, uh, that's the cost-benefit analysis I talked about. Uh, again, this is uh, you know, security is very, very important. Uh, uh, business continuity and disaster recovery. You know, uh, uh, all these different areas: uh, consolidation of uh, VNFs, uh, algorithm for nested VNFs, um, complexity, energy efficiency, service assurance, and maybe you know, uh, my vision is that I might be able to come up with new VNFs, uh, virtual network functions that we couldn't have done before for whatever reason. Uh, that's, that's what I hope that one day we'll be able to achieve. You can find more information on our portal, which is not a very friendly portal, unfortunately, but uh, there's a link that uh, goes to NFV uh, research. Okay, so the last or last but one topic is service chain and service insertion. So, so in, in, uh, in a service chain in which environment you have you know, the physical switches and also you have the visual switches that connect to the uh, to the VMs, right? And uh, you have these uh, service chains represented here by, by traffic flow, so one flow can test the visual firewall, the road balancer, the T-packet inspection, the PCDN, and so forth. Another one might test only the firewall without having to go through the load balancer. But in this picture, what I show is that each of them has to test uh, the visual suites, right? It can be a visual, I mean, it, it doesn't have necessarily but I don't think we'll be able to send, you know, to, to be able to link those, right? You have to go through the virtual suites, right? There's no other way to provide uh, direct connectivity. So that's why I think that the virtual suite, you know, can play, it, it's a very important functional block uh, in, uh, in this, uh, in this um, um, architecture. And uh, again, it's a virtual suite, so, it, you know, it can be any software tools on top of that to support the, uh, Things like uh, 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 quality of service, traffic metering, you know, service assurance, all of these nice things, and monitoring. No. So, um, and the other thing I show here is that, and it's not that visible, is that all these different instances of the same uh, virtualized network function, they have to form a tenant, uh, a, um, a, a virtual network. And because now different functions are sharing the same infrastructure, right, the same service. Right, and same uh, and same network, but somehow you need to provide traffic isolation, and that's what I think. Uh, the network become very very handy. Uh, again.
again, how you create that, you know, there are like different uh, ways to do it today. You can use uh, uh, virtual network overlays, uh, and targeting approaches. Uh, maybe you can use metadata to essentially tag the applications. Um, and, uh, and also what you can add, and this thing you can do is that the policies actually determine the set of the chain order. So not everybody has, and, and this is the added uh, flexibility of uh, NLP. Now you have everything virtualized, you can define your own order of how these things are going to be chained, right? In the past it was again static, one box connects to another box. Of course you have, I mean if you want to uh, connect them in a different way, you have to send someone out. But now things are virtualized, you can connect them any way you want. And that opens up the, uh, what I call here, programmable service chains. So we can actually make this in a programmatic fashion. Uh, and then you can, you know, uh, being a you know, server, you can you know, do branching loops, whatever. Okay, so, um, okay, virtual sheets are very, very important here. Uh, when it comes to redundancy and just, uh, just recovery, uh, you have to wonder, you know, if a virtual switch goes down because, you know, it's running uh, on, on a server, you have to say what is the redundancy, what is the uh, plan in case uh, you know, something goes down, right? So do I need to make have a stateful architecture or has it been completely stateless? Again, this is an open question. I don't have the answer for, for that, how you provide all these performance guarantees uh, and, uh, you know, language and structure for this Describing those service chains, we think that's another area of, uh, of uh, research, you know, describing this formative behavior, accounting for constraints, for security, or its bandwidth, and so on. Okay, um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, well, what I present here is that you have this is the current environment, you have three you know, isolated networks. Uh, when you move into uh, virtual machines, they're all running uh, uh, on. You know, somewhere on the cloud, they get the control plane essentially uh, controlling these uh, VMs. Um, let me skip that. Uh, for necro virtualization I talked about. Um, let's skip that. What I want to show you is the last thing is uh, what we're working on in our, uh, off, uh, in our uh, office in San Francisco. So when working on a VPC test, the VPC is the whole packet core, constitutes the mobile packet core for the LT uh, architecture. Uh, so this is the, uh, the uh, architecture for the, uh, for the EPC. So uh, there have been some efforts around uh, to virtualize the entire architecture. So these are like different boxes, right? You see the, the uh, packet gateway, the service gateway, the MME, all these are like different boxes uh, uh, running in the network today. So there are efforts to actually virtualize all of these boxes. So once you visualize all these boxes, essentially you visualize the entire architecture. Uh, the interesting thing about this, uh, this thing here, and the why I present it is that there are two approaches you can do that. So one approach is what they call verticalized. So you take one of these boxes, right? It could be the MME, the uh, mobile management entity. And you can say, okay, I'm gonna map that particular box into a server and that function is gonna be running on a number of VMs. Right? And that's what you see here, right? That's one server, another server, another server, and so forth, right? And it's running all these different uh, 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 VMs. So essentially, a physical box is mapped to a VM, that, that uh, actually to multiple VMs, to be, to be exact, but run on one, one particular server. And uh, that's, that's quite inefficient, because it requires many processes uh, uh, to, 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 to run these things here, and if you have if you have, if you want to add capacity, right, you want you have to uh, essentially duplicate the whole thing here. Let's say you want to add capacity because authentication for whatever reason you want to authenticate more users, right? You have to essentially duplicate the whole uh, the whole uh, uh, solution here. That's why we think it's inefficient. There are other approaches. But essentially, they say, okay, instead of verticalizing that, we can run things across. So uh, this uh, authentication. A functionality can run on many VMs uh, that runs across my infrastructure, right? It's not one single uh, VM per, per function. And uh, if, I, if I need to add capacity with, with respect to authentication, all I need to do is launch more VMs. So that gives you more flexibility. What happens here is that sort of like it breaks down the uh, EPC architecture in a way, right? It's, it, it doesn't violate it, but it breaks down 
from the way it was, uh, it was originally uh, uh, designed. So I, I present this as an example of, of, you know, of the benefits that one can get with uh, uh, visualizing the uh, network function. This is called node disaggregation, right? It's sort of like mapping one box into, uh, 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 into a, uh, a number of VMs that run on the same, same server. You just run this across a number of uh, servers. So essentially, you know, you remove any boundaries between those functional uh, boxes. Uh, so that's that's what we uh, that's what it's, people call the cloud uh, EPC. So, and the last piece I want to present here, and, and we think will actually uh, uh, NLP and SDN meet, is that once the things are running in software, it's easy to uh, integrate other software solutions. So one thing that we did with EFS back there. Uh, a couple of years ago was to use OpenFlow to do mobile traffic of loading, right? So you can use OpenFlow um, and to, to say, okay, I uh, want that particular flow to be offloaded and uh, into Wi-Fi network. So, um, and, and the, uh, uh, the Active Network Discovery uh, Selection uh, 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 function is the one which is responsible for essentially identifying Wi-Fi security, right? So if I have a mob, an SDN-based mobile traffic of load solution, in the past, I have to go to Ericsson or Alcatelus and say, can you please integrate this software solution into your box? And since I'm Orange, you know, they say, yes, I can do that, but it will take three years, right, to, to do this you know, integration. But today, let's say if I have a vendor who does uh, works on, on these particular solutions, you know, I can take their solution and plug it in into my software-based AMD setting. Right. Assuming that again the interfaces exist, and that goes back to your question of whether you know. So the answer is, hopefully, we like this interface in the service chain to you know to, to be compatible, but nobody can guarantee that. Right? We don't know this is this is going to happen. So uh, so that's what I think it's the, the beauty of when it comes to NIV and SDN is is what because both are software, so you can easily, at least in theory. Integrate solutions uh, into uh, into each other. So I, th I think you know doing that. You know I think this is a very exciting actually use case that demonstrates both uh, you know SDN and NLP how you can use SDN in NLP environment. Uh, uh, okay, I think that's all I had. Um, any questions? Did I answer your question or? Yeah. So yeah, so the interface, so I know for sure that here's what happens. So when you get these management orchestration uh, solutions from vendors, these solutions, and I don't want to throw names here, they only work with particular software vendors, right? So, uh, and we might see the same thing with service chain. There's nothing today that guarantees, I mean, hopefully, you know, but we don't know what kind of hooks the vendors can put there, right? Because as you see, when it comes to uh, this, what happens today is that anything who provides a hardware solution, they say, here's also our software solution, right? And they want to protect their business. So we don't know whether that you might see partnerships forming, right? And uh, so when it comes to service chaining, we don't know how this, you know, because again, we don't know how to chain those things yet, whether it's going to be using metadata. So if this, we're going to use here some sort of metadata, maybe we're not going to support the same format without metadata. If it's more an, op an open solution, like uh, if we use SDN to you know, do the traffic steering, you know, uh, maybe it you know, be easier. I don't know. I don't have the answer to you know, how this is going to play out. Any other questions? Yes. So I, that I can answer. IETF has this group called Service Function Chaining, which right. is looking at the same problem as what right. BNFFG is. So are these two groups, is the HC group and the ITF group, are they working together? What is the relationship between the two? So, uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that such a group exists. Um, so what happens is, again, we, as I said, we, uh, we expire in January next year. So what we said that uh, there are like different pieces here that fit in, in other organizations. So they can propose solutions. Uh, I don't think we work directly with them, but it doesn't mean that, you know, so, so everything is one use case, right? It's not that we're trying to build a solution that we don't, we don't try to standardize that. So, and I'm thinking that ITF, they're trying to provide some sort of standardized solution around right. that, I That's guess. Right. So, yeah. we are aware of it, but we're not working directly with them. Okay. So, are you feeding requirements into them? Is, it, uh, is there any kind of... So, so the, the only thing that we have published so far in terms of requirement is that reference architecture. Yeah. 
to be uh, to be honest. So th there are some gaps. Actually, we have something what we call gap analysis. We're trying to identify the different gaps and how we fit with other organizations. Obviously, IETF and the broadband uh, uh, forum, uh, uh, ONF, of course, uh, you know, are, are relevant to us. But uh, uh, again, this is still you know um, uh, work in progress. So yes. Yeah. So one example, one, one question. Um, do you see, while you're making this uh, shift from hardware appliances to, to software, the, the functionality which is within appliances to be breaking down to simpler components that scale individually? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. For, you, you're, you're mentioning the, the virtual CP where the, the modem that we have at home will be on, on, on a data center. So. Is this going to happen as an app, a DHCP, a rate limiter, a, an accounting all together? Or do you see having a separate NAT function, uh, a separate DHCP function, and these things run in parallel, and you're doing heavy chaining on individual functionalities? I probably can, it could be either. Um, I, I think mostly it would be, to ask, to ask this kind of thing, it won't be operator specific, because not all the operators are running the same uh, home gateways, obviously. So some will have more flexibility mm -hmm. than, than others. So I think it's more like an implementation issue. Uh, what, what the, the essence is that we definitely want to simply, so we want to make that home gateway as, as simple as possible with very little uh, uh, software, that software that we can control remotely, essentially, mm -hmm. because we don't want to you know, be in the business of changing that home gateway every so often, right, upgrading it or anything like that. Um, so, uh, but how this is going to be done, I don't think it's within our scope, right? It's, it's, it's more of a implementation issue. Bob, you had a question? Or? Oh, I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. Um, yeah, I know. So, uh, <laughs> it's a good thing I'm running out of time. <laughs> I so. didn't actually raise my hand. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so I can only keep today for you. So, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so I had a couple of questions. You talked about disaggregation of, of NFB. Uh, I've heard people like, you know, to my master say that for many of these things, like firewalls and load balancing, you can disaggregate it to the point where they sort of don't exist as an entity at all. They're just implemented sort of as an algorithm in the SDM controller. And the functionality is just yeah. is actually sort of you know implemented at the edge of the network, say, and you know they suggest an open V switch. Right. Uh, right. Do you right. find do you find that uh, have, you, have you looked at that and have you found that to be the case for any of your NFV, for any of your virtual network functions? No, we have not, but that's how you know that's how we started with SDN. Like when we're looking at SDN and we're working with Open Program, we you know, we uh, in some of the applications like we don't need those things for separately. You can actually integrate that into the virtual switch, right? But what happens if not everybody has that virtual switch, right? I mean, how do you make sure that you know, um, and, and and the other thing is that the, the VMs when we think running things in VX it gives you the flexibility of uh, you know creating one of these instances. And, and it's uh, creating those um, uh, in the market tennis network it makes more sense to have this individual running on the edge rather than having anything on, on the virtual switch itself. Mm, it could be a real switch though. For, for example, if, you had, if, you're, you know, if your customers had open flow switches, you might be able to, to program them. Also, if you, if you're, uh, if like you said, the, uh, the aggregation network or the central office um, you know, is 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 the sort of data center kind of network, then you, know, you might have a whole lot of virtual switches there. You can use yeah, something. I mean, I think to me, to answer your question, I think it would be more a performance issue, whether that thing can scale, but uh, in principle, I agree with you. And that's why I said that the virtual switch is the, to me, is the yeah, most yeah. important block, see, because you can start okay. integrating all yeah, these yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, okay, like, I understand what you mean yeah. now, which is yeah. The, yeah. when you said the virtual switch is important, that's exactly what you were talking about. Right. Right? You can also have a good start with SDN, right? We're looking at SDN, we say they can use it for firewall, for load balancer, for right, right. right? So, yeah. my, my other question is I just saw uh, Amin uh, Bada and talked to him in my group in last night at the end of And they, they said something really interesting, which was, well, they said a lot of interesting things, but one of them was that for Google's network, they found it very useful to, for Google's network, yeah. they found it very useful to extend SDN to the data plane to have programmable uh, packet processing. Yeah. And uh, sort of, have, have you you know looked at that or found it? Do you think it's it's uh, necessary or useful? So that, that required changing the chip, right? Well, they they were sort of yeah. cagey as they usually are about their implementation, but you know you can imagine no, you no, can no, imagine no, that it, you can imagine that it could be done in a lot of ways. It could be done as something you know in a VM using you know existing APIs like Click. It could be in it could be done in like you said in FPGA. 
It could also be done in something like a network processor. You might have, you might have different implementations of varying sorts of hardware, but perhaps a common API to control them all. So that's sort of thing they were seeing. Is that like that zero idea? No, uh, this is data plane processing, not not control plane. You know, so so some, an example of data plane processing that uh, that uh, carriers do is you know they compress web pages or something like that. You know they compress traffic or you know uh, compression encryption. Uh, you know lots of things. There's lots there's lots of uh, you know counting uh, measurement. I mean DPI is sort of is certainly data plane. Right. Um, so my right. question is is you know have you thought about you know data plane APIs and trying to extend extend SDN so that you see the, the data plane so that you can write things in sort of an orthogonal manner that might work on different platforms. I cannot give any advice myself, uh, I mean lately, I mean, I, I, when I was working at SDN like three or four years ago, you know, uh, and uh, you know, that was one of the things right, like, uh, when it comes to uh, mm -hmm. uh, SDN, because it's all about software at the end of the day, and how you can make things programmable, so you can do that with a like, question and not. I don't, I don't see anything, you know, that's anything wrong with it. Actually, for, for now, we don't even focus on the data plane. We're focusing on, on the DNS. Yeah, the interesting it's very, thing, very weird. They, they, they seem to be implying that for their use cases, there were a lot of things that were, um, you know, they, they weren't necessarily, they didn't scale, they didn't sort of were pretty inefficient to implement in software on a VM. Right, But right. they could be implemented efficiently in what, some sort of custom hardware. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good point, actually, because if you ask me today whether, you know, because we said that these are, should be running on standardized IT, servers, if you ask me, is that going to be the case? Uh, maybe not, because some of the functions may still require some specialized processing and they uh, an accelerated thing. And that's why I want to do the performance things first, right? Because if the performance doesn't match and say, oh, you know what, yeah, you can do that, but maybe you're not going to get this much. Then um, companies like Metronome, for instance, are doing uh, specialized uh, you know, uh, hardware server hardware for that. So, um, so so yes, the, question, the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, let's, let's, let's wrap that Thank up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir.